Good dear ladies and gentlemen. Good night for Oceania and Asia. Good afternoon for Africa and Europe. Good morning for Americas. Welcome each one of you to this ITTF HPD webinar series with the webinar number 37, Rules Interpretation for Coaches. This is Ramon Ortega Montes from the Education Unit. Today we have two speakers, one is referee, the other one is coach. It's with long experience, experience to talk and discuss today's topic. But before I introduce them, let me do some housekeeping. We know that many of you already know this software, but we are going to record this webinar. And you have at your right part of the blue jeans screen some icons, the icon of the participants chat, the icon of the polls. There will be a number of polls during the webinar for you to complete. And last but not least, write down all your questions in the chat section at the right of your screen, where the icon of question and answers appears at the bottom. Panelists will try to answer as many as possible in the question and answer part of the webinar. And now, enjoy the webinar. Let's go with the introduction of the two panelists. Werner Turi from Austria, International Referee Advance since 2014. Also ITTF URC Deputy Chair in charge of referees. He was appointed referee for the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. And he has experience in different world championships in Germany, in Netherlands, also World Cups in Japan, United Arab Emirates and Germany, and different European championships and platinum world tours. So he was officiating with both middle level to high level players until to the highest top level professional players and coaches. Hello, Bernard. Hello. Hi, thank you. Nice to meet you and to discuss a very important topic for all of us. Thank you very much. Now we go to introduce John Murphy from Ireland. He's professional coach from 2008 with the level one, two and three certificates of coaches from Ireland. Head coach, Northern Ireland, also head coach of Ireland. And finally, he is currently head national coach from Australia, getting bronze medal at the Commonwealth Championships in 2015 in Northern Ireland, and also leading now Australia to gain the qualification for Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. But also, he has been a player five times Irish National Senior Championship and playing professionally in different leagues, Sweden, Germany, France, Norway, and Great Britain. So deep experience as player, as well as coach. So I think it's midnight there in Australia, John. So thank you very much for being joining us. Yeah, thank you, Moncho. Thanks for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here this morning or this night, wherever you are. And I look forward to uh, working with Werner and bringing some nice material for, for everybody. So, as in previous occasions, this webinar is not only the webinar itself, but also a useful educational material that will help to understand better the rules and the know-how for the coaches and players, and even for the umpires also referees. Thank you to all of you for the big interest. We had two entries and we have like 69 coaches already uh, interested in this topic. So just let's go, Bernard and John, the floor is yours for the presentations. Okay, so, um... Thanks, Moncho. We are going to discuss together now, really, uh, from both sides, from the coaches' sides and the sides of the match officials, 
And before we start, I think it's important uh, that all of us uh, could keep in mind what are the main objectives, what are our main tasks uh, if we are in the in the venue. So looking at the metro officials and the coaches, uh, could we start with the presentation? Is it on? No. Okay. So for both of us, and I think uh, we will agree, John, that it's, uh, it's the fair play. That's the most important topic, of course. That's what we all want to have. Then, uh, if we continue for the match officials, of course, what we have to do, and this is our task, and we should never forget if we have any discussions together, that uh, we have we are responsible for the management of a tournament or a match in accordance with the regulations. So we have to take care of the regulations. And uh, next one, and uh, of course. Also important for us are the conditions. So we have to ensure that we have the best conditions for both players. If you're looking now to the coaches, can I just uh, click to the coaches, all of them, four of them? So, uh, Don, I would say you will agree that perhaps you can just say what is really important for you here in this yeah. case. Yeah, obviously, obviously agreed completely with Werner. The fair play is is something that we as coaches probably work with the players from junior national team. They learn this, and and obviously when they play in the big events, they they of course have experienced how to how to play fair and and, and what is fair. Um, in terms of best conditions, of course, we always look for our players to that the that the conditions is 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 best for our players. I will say sometimes it, it can be the same like officials. We, we we do think sometimes the other player we don't only think our own, but generally it's it's our own player. And um, again, supporting our player in the same way, and of course as coach, working with the player we want to win. This is this is really important. And that's probably the big difference between officials and coaches. The, the coaches there really wants to win, win with their player. Yeah, I think this is this is something we always have to keep in mind because uh, uh, there is uh, the task for a coach. What he wants to have is that the play his player is winning or her player is winning. So if there are any discussions as a match official, I should never forget why this person is is acting in this way. He he has or he or she they, has a specific role as a coach. So we have to understand why we have some discussions. But the other way around, also the coaches have to understand that we have to follow the regulations and the best conditions for both players have to be ensured. Okay, the next one. Yeah, uh, this is just one more general information. Most of you know it on the top level. There's no problem if you talk about the referee or the umpire, but uh, also, sometimes if you're working on the middle or lower level, there's very often a discussion who is a referee and who is an umpire. So they have two different roles. As a referee, you are the one managing the tournament in accordance with the regulations. So you are not the one as a referee sitting on the table, sitting uh, in the field of play doing one match. You are responsible for the whole tournament, for the whole event. If, it go, if you're talking about rule interpretation, again, it's the referee. The referee is responsible for the rule interpretation. And at the end, the referee is supervising the umpire. So if there are any troubles, if there are any appeals, you will discuss later the appeals, then it will be the referee who has to go there, who has to make a decision. So uh, looking uh, at the top level, at ITTF events, you, you might see the difference already in the clothes. So you can see here a referee with the dark blue uh, is the referee and with khaki shirts and uh, someone with uh, light blue and the black shorts uh, will be the umpire. That's the difference you can see on the top level, but not always easy uh, to see on the lower level who is the referee, who is the umpire. But you realize it if you see who is on the table. The one on the table is the umpire. So he is the one responsible for the management of the match. He will de he will decide the rally, the result of each rally. And this person has the final decision 
on all questions of fact. What is a question of fact? Or, the, or a, a decision of fact, I have to say, a final decision on, the, on, a, on a decision of fact. A decision of fact uh, would be, for example, an edge ball. Here is the decision, either edge or not edge, for example. Okay, so that's uh, what we have to always keep in mind. There's an umpire on the table, and there's a referee responsible for the whole event. Okay? Yes, important, because many times it happens that some of the coaches or the players are coming to talk with us and they refer to referee, but after some minutes or some seconds, we realize that they are talking about the umpires. So thank you very much. This is important. Okay. Um, so one of the most important things is uh, the appeal, the protest. Where can I make an appeal? And uh, this is something uh, we're discussing quite often with uh, coaches also. That uh, if you as a coach are coming to the referee at the end of the match, telling us uh, the performance of the umpire was horrible, there have been wrong decisions, wrong interpretation of rules at the end of, of the match, there is no chance for us to change anything. So as a coach, you have the possibility for appeals. The only thing uh, where you can make no appeal again is against a decision of fact. So, if the umpire go, calls an edge, says it's, it's edge, and the point to his or her play, and the point to this player, then it's a decision of fact. There is no appeal possible. And uh, I'm sure uh, also John will have some situations or knows some situations where he, he saw, or in, in his opinion, it is an edge, for example, or it is a net, or it's a wrong service in this case, uh, that he wants to make an appeal. But it's really, there's no possibility. So you can call the referee, the referee will go there, but the referee will tell you what is the decision. The decision is edge, for example. So in this case, no appeal possible. When is an appeal uh, possible? It's the interpretation of rules by an umpire. So our common problem, we all know, is the service rule. The service rule always makes troubles, but we're looking at the service rule, so if uh, if the ball is uh, if if you start with the service and the ball goes under the table, it's clear it is not correct. It's a fault. So you can make an appeal. You can say uh, it's, for me as a coach, this is not okay. But then again, the referee goes there. The referee will tell you, sorry, this is clearly against the rules. So there was no problem. It's a decision of fact also, and it's 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 covered by the rules. But uh, we also had some cases where we had uh, umpires telling to the players uh, it's a service fault because I could not see the record. Your record was under the table. In this case, and that's really important now, in this case, if you have the feeling the interpretation of rules is not correct by an umpire, please, as a coach, immediately stop the match, call for the referee. Don't make long dis long discussions with the umpire. The umpire has made his decision. It might be a wrong one, but if you start a discussion with the umpire, the, the chance for a solution will be very low, and it takes a lot of time. So immediately, you can always stop the match. You can call for the referee. The umpire has to accept that you have the right for the appeal. And then the referee will go there and say, okay, interpretation of rules. In this case, sorry, it was wrong because the record can be under the table. So then the, he will change the decision of the umpire. Werner, that yes. call done from the player or from the coach asking for the referee? That's exactly uh, will uh, will be the uh, if it's a, if it's a, a match, uh, it has to be. Uh, if it's a team match, of course, it's uh, by the captain there. And if it's uh, if it's an individual match, normally uh, it has to be the player who is doing the appeal. So the player can say, I will appeal. But then, of course, the coach will call the referee. That's the way how we should go. So in the team match... John, uh, yeah, John uh, that, any experience related to this happened to you? Can you share with us? Yeah. 
it's, it's happened to me on a, on a number of occasions, and, and I was about to come in there. It's an interesting that uh, how Werner has put it. Actually, generally, it was the player who who signaled when it was an individual match uh, to to the referee, and of course, I knew as a coach that the the rule or the decision would not be changed. Uh, but again, it was it was the player in that moment who who called the referee, and the referee came down from the head head uh, head head desk um, and spoke to the to the umpire. But yeah, it was in fact the player. I I, I have never called the the referee as a, in an individual match. However, I have done it in a team match. Yeah, but uh, uh, what? Uh... What happens is uh, the player is the one who has to make the appeal, and then the uh, the coach can support and can go for the referee if the referee is not coming in this case. But yes. it's important, and 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 that's uh, uh, we have two more slides on this. So the last slide on appeals will be exactly who is the one who can do the appeal. So that's exactly for the individual. Uh, it's always the player, and for a team match, of course, it's the captain. Um, yeah, what is really, and I'm uh, perhaps also John had this case, uh, this case is with the decision of fact. Really, there's there's no chance. And also, if you have your own camera, so you have your video and you can prove that uh, it, it's a wrong decision because it was edge, or in this case, we cannot change it. We are not allowed to change a decision of fact because of video. The only chance is the new system, this Hawkeye, like in tennis, we call it TTR. There, in this case, you, you can say you want to have a review. But in 99% of all our matches, we don't have this TTR, so decision of fact cannot be changed. So I had this case also in the European Youth Championships in Bratislava in a very important match in the doubles, and it was edge or not edge, it was the match point. And uh, at the end, there was a decision, and everyone wanted to show me the video. But, as a referee, I said, sorry, uh, the video, I cannot use the video. Although I know, and I was really interested to see what happened, but I could not look to the video. So that's what we, what we have to accept. Good, uh, the next next one. Yeah, and uh, there might also be a decision of the referee on the question of a tournament or a match contact. So it might be, for example, also on which table we are playing, or uh, can we uh, have this match postponed or not postponed? If the if the referee makes a decision on this, this is not covered by the laws and the regulations. Then, as a coach, you can can make the appeal to the competition manager, and then this decision will be the final one. We always tell our our match officials, our referees that such decisions always have to be done together with the competition manager, of course. But still, you have the chance, if you are not satisfied with uh, with the time, for example, and you think there was something wrong, you can always go to the competition management and make an appeal. Uh, I'm also sure, John, you had such cases where you have been not been satisfied with the timetable or changes? Yeah, there's there's been probably one incident where in the in the morning the draw was wrong and you can clearly see that that the players were in the wrong wrong seated positions and and then of course um it was flagged at a late point and of course the starting time of the event had to be pushed by one hour and this was this was one of those instances okay good then now we can go to the next one yeah, and here uh, we can see now what we already discussed. So who can do the appeal, the player or the coach? And the individual event, the appeal may be made only by the player. Uh, and there have also I had some questions about the junior events. So if you really have a player with 11, 12, 13 years, uh, we also accept if the coach is doing the protest. It's not 100% uh, according uh, to the rules, looking at the rules. But there is an agreement. Uh, if there's a junior, then uh, it can also be the coach who can do this. In a team event, it's the captain of a team. So the captain of a team, and that's why we are asking in a team event. It's important that the match officials are asking who is the captain of the team. 
because only this person uh, can do the appeal. I had one case where, where a player wanted to complain, and at the end I said, sorry, but you can complain, but you cannot make an appeal. If your coach, if your captain is doing the appeal, it's fine for me. But the captain told me, no, no, everything is fine. I will not make an appeal. So really, I should not forget who is the one. And important, do the appeal immediately, please. Don't do it after the match. After the match, it's too late. So, Werner, uh, you say the captain. So, who who the, the captain is? Because it can be the coach, it can be the player, it can be the manager. Who is the captain? The captain is the one nominated uh, by the team. So, if we have now, for example, uh, a team match with, with Australia, we will ask uh, Australia, who is your captain? And this and this person, in this case, it, normally it should be John, would be on the score sheet. It should be written on the score sheet, the team captain is. Because this person is also responsible for uh, for the draw, responsible for the net nomination of the players and for the appeals. Good. Uh, the next one, advice. Perhaps, uh, John, you could give us a short summary about uh, the new rules. How is the new rule uh, for you as a coach that you are allowed to give an advice? In general, uh, did it make your life easier? Or uh, what's your opinion about the new rule now? I actually think it was a little bit more complicated, especially in the time uh, they changed this rule. I was working a lot with younger players, new players, and I felt that actually it was maybe detrimental to how they played, that I felt that the coaches maybe spoke a little bit too much and uh, it kind of hampered the play and, and also hampered the development somehow of the players. Um, and that was more from a youth youth level perspective. I found myself not really changing so much. I did use some encouragement, but I found that I really didn't didn't change my style of coaching from when we when we couldn't talk um, in 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 the in in the games. Um, in terms of now using it at a higher level, in terms of qualifying for the Olympic Games and so on, I do find it very useful being able to give some guidance to the players in really crucial moments. So it is it is very important, but I think we need to segregate it as coaches. So I think it's different when you work with youth players as opposed to working with professional players in in major events, where I think where I think it's it, it's crucially important. But with the youth players, I think too much talking can be also too much, and, and it kind of impact their development. Okay. Uh, so in an individual event, you there's one person, so in this case, if it's if it's one of your players, it would be John who would be designated beforehand to the umpire, and only this person is allowed to sit on the bench and to give advice, no one else. Uh, of course, there's an exception. If you have players from different associations, then you have two coaches on the bench. But important, they are treated like they are one person. Uh, this, this is the one uh, with the individual event, we don't have too many big troubles. Uh, it's only if one uh, one coach is responsible for more than uh, one player in one event. It, I think it might happen, John. I, I'm not sure if you can confirm that you have to go from one table to the second table. Happens this yes. to your for you? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And he and here we have to be careful because if you if you go to one table and uh, as a second one. Uh, for example, a player is sitting on the on the on the chair on the second table, then you cannot change with this person. So, if you are changing from one table to the next table, then it's only you and no one else can take the seat. That's important because if the second the other Werner, person is taking, I can say that that one, Werner. What we what we do um, is if if we're coaching two matches or we have two players playing at the same, it's it's that they put our name also there. So that the the umpire knows that it's 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 me. So so we, we yeah. clearly define who it is and, and then yeah, 
there's no questions when you when you come if nobody's sitting there and they know that you can you can assume as coach so this is something i would also like to uh to emphasize again to our umpires and referees here um, in this webinar there's no prob problem if the chair at the beginning is empty because sometimes then uh, i i receive a request how is it possible that now in the beginning, there was no one, and now there's another one. There's one person sitting there. That's why I ask them always ask for the name of the coach. It can be empty in the beginning, and there can be the coach later also in joining this match. There's no problem concerning this. Please don't forget it as a match official. Uh, team event. This is something uh, we are always having some discussions about the team event. Uh, who would sit on your bench, John, if, you, if there's a team event? So. Normally the the full team, so if it's five players, one will play, four players and myself would be would be sitting in the bench. Uh, would you uh, sit with uh, free coaches, for example? Yeah, so we actually in the in the Olympic trials where we uh, to qualify for Olympic Games, we were allowed to have two coaches on the bench and we chose to do so. And um, so I've had that scenario as well, where where we've had two advisors, and um, but still we had the the maximum on the bench. So one of the players therefore stepped off the bench and didn't didn't sit on the bench. Yeah, okay. Because if you look at the rules, the, the rules uh, it's clearly stated anyone authorized to be at the playing area. So this could be if the if uh, if the grandmother has an accreditation card, she could sit on the bench. It could also be that five coaches are sitting on the bench. There's no rule uh, describing how many coaches, just saying anyone authorized. There might be some events where it's, uh, where it's uh, stated in the beginning. If you look at uh, the prospectus, it might be stated only one coach. But in 95%, normally just looking at the rules, anyone can sit on the bench. It can be five coaches. Why are we talking about this also? If you look to the... Next slide, so you, you will see why this might be a discussion also. So when, and this is now in the last years, the new one, the new rule, it's allowed at any time, only except during rallies, of course. You cannot just give advice, uh, but I don't think you will do it as a coach because you will also disturb your own player. Important is the play should not be delayed. And this is uh, one of the drivers that sometimes it can be used to delay a match. Okay. Next one. Yeah. And uh, so if, if the person is not authorized to give advice, the umpire has to show immediately the red card. So if it's John who is nominated as a coach and another one is sitting there, you have to show immediately the red card. And then the authorized person. If the authorized person, so if uh, the one coach would give now uh, would give illegal advice. Now it will not happen so often anymore, but still, you give illegal advice, then the umpire has to show the yellow card. And we should not forget the team bench is a unit, so this yellow card is valid for the whole bench. So if anyone else, so it could be the coach could have the yellow card, but then another one is talking, giving illegal advice, it will be immediately the red card. And the red card means you have to leave the venue. Normally you should go out of the venue or at least in a place where you have no possibility to give advice or to disturb the match. And uh, you are not allowed to return to the bench. And you cannot be replaced. So if we are starting with five on the bench, for example, we have one red card. It means four on the bench. And here, that's why we have sometimes a discussion also. If you have now five coaches on the bench, in reality, you have five times a chance to give illegal advice. But again, it's not anymore like in previous time. But there would have been the possibility with, to work with five coaches. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, there's also the, the problem that uh, you get the you give the yellow card to the coach, and the coach doesn't want to leave. Did you have these troubles, uh, John, already that uh, 
you were not satisfied or, the, or did you ever get the red card is the first question yeah all, all the time i'm always getting sent off the bench now and um, i've had yellow cards so i've never been sent off the bench um they've probably been a little bit more lenient on me and um, given the given the rules that we've gone through now i probably should have been sent off the bench a couple of times um but yeah we've had we've had of course players uh sent off the bench but not 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 myself Okay, and again, this is something which I always uh, tell to my officials. It's the task for me. It's the task of a coach to give advice at a specific moment. Sometimes it's even his task or her task uh, to do it in a way, knowing that uh, the yellow card or the red card uh, is uh, is the is, is the ultimate result if I'm working like this. But honestly, if it's 11, 10, and you know how you can uh, influence a little bit the match, and you know it could be the 12, 10. Well, I think uh, giving illegal advice might be one option for for a coach if you support your own player. But as an official, I have to give perhaps the red card or the yellow card. But don't forget, it's the normal task of a coach. So it is, it is never on a personal level. It just my work I have to do as a coach. I hope, uh, John, it's okay for you if, if, I, if I speak now about two moments as a coach, but I think this is important to understand as an official that some yeah. cases are like in a specific way. Very important. Okay, the next one. Yeah, this now, it's really difficult to read. I'm not, I'm not sure if you can see it. But I just want to give you uh, the hint that on the ITDF website, uh, you can find a list uh, with different scenarios where you can see what is a legal advice, what is illegal advice, and what is even misbehavior. So, for example, you're looking at the first one is advice during a rally. Advice during a rally, we discussed it already, it's a legal advice. So, it's clearly a warning, so a yellow card for the first time for the coach. The same is also the advice between the end of the practice and the start of the match. There's also It's also illegal advice if you give at the end of a practice and the start of a match. Uh, we could say, but they are, not, they are not in a rally. It's correct, they are not in a rally, but it's delaying the start of the match. So we do not uh, allow the, that there's an advice between the end of the practice. No problem during a suspension of play. No, no problem between the uh, between rallies. So this is quite easy. Uh, what also happens sometimes is uh, that the player is kicking the ball uh, in the corner where his uh, coach is sitting, or moves very slowly there. Then this is a, a a yellow card. This is a yellow card for the player because the player is delaying the match. Is time is doing a time wasting. So this is again uh, something we should not forget that uh, here we have to act as a match official. And also, of course, uh, as an example, for example, as, a, for, as an example is uh, if uh, the player is ready to start with the service with the ball on the ball, and as a coach, I start to give advice as a coach of the opponent, of course, hopefully, because I don't want to disturb my own player, but as a coach. Of the opponent, if I give advice in this way that I'm disturbing the server, this is misbehavior. So it's it's again it's a or illegal advice. So it's again a yellow card. No problem if you look to, if you look to the coach if the coach is giving advice to the uh, toweling, all these things are okay. But you can see this list uh, on the ITDF website if you go to umpires and referee documents. Committees, umpire, referee documents. Uh, I, did you have troubles, John, or is there anything you could like you, you could add from your side? No, I, I just think even from this table alone, it's very important to go through this as a coach with your player. I think even even when I seen this uh, in your in your presentation, it, it was that I went over all of them again and, and really really understood it, and and I think that can help coaches. I think work better with 
umpires and officials when they really know the rules a little bit more in depth. Some of these, some of these things, I, I'm not even sure the players know that it's a that it's a yellow card or a warning or whatever for for doing it. So I think it's very worthwhile to look at this and really go over it with your players. Okay. Good. We also. We also saw during the, the WTT event, the test event in Macau, we saw that some of these things were uh, there were done some tests for the future for some WTT tournaments, like going toweling, talking with the player and coach. Yeah, but uh, here we have we have uh, to be careful because WTT. Especially Macau. Macau was really a test event. There were there were some excellent ideas, and also some um, scenarios we might use in the future, perhaps. But in the moment, we have to stick to the rules, and the, the rules and regulations are not changed yet. So you cannot say that uh, Macau is a perfect example for this, because there have been a lot of uh, new implementations, new regulations, which are not according to the ITDF rules in the moment, but we can so, learn from this, and I think it was important. Okay, so clear. Twenty uh, handbook for uh, with the rules and regulations. That is what is updated. Yeah, exactly. This is the one. Uh, again, if you want to see the, this uh, handbook for match officials or the hand, or the rules, the ITDF handbook, you can always find it again on the ITDF website. And sometimes it's really good to take some minutes to read. And to see if there if there are changes and some important uh, rules which you might need as an official, but also as a player or a coach. Because if you know the rules, then you uh, then you can also understand perhaps sometimes the way why the official is acting in this way. Good. Uh, the procedures for the call area. So the call area. Uh, of course, in most of the time we have the call area only uh, only the top events. But if you are in top events and you have a call area, this means uh, you meet each other 20 minutes for the individual event, events, 45 minutes for the team events. You're going to meet each other, so both captains or players. It depends if it's an individual, of course, it's the player. Otherwise, it's the, the captain. You meet there and you, you, you start the preparation for the match. The idea behind the call area is just that all these uh, things are done outside and not in the venue. So it's not the spectators or in TV, you should not see all these preparations which have to be done before. So 45 minutes, if it's a team match before the match, you have to be present as a coach, the team captain. Because if you are not present within five minutes, or it might be specified by the referee at a different time, but Normally it's five minutes. You immediately lose the right to uh, uh, for the toss for A, B, X, Y, and also for the bench side, and also the color of the shirt. So please really be careful. Try to be on time if you are late, and then you have to understand that uh, you are losing all your rights. So if only one captain is there, this captain has the right to choose everything, and. Uh, why can we not normally wait longer than five minutes? First of all, uh, it would not be fair to the other coach who is there or the other player in the individual event. Again, it's 20 minutes for the individual event. Uh, if the player would have to wait there because they are preparing, the players are preparing for their match. The coaches perhaps might want to talk with the players. So that's why five minutes. Otherwise, we are starting. And if you are not submitting your composition on time, the referee applies the sequence of the players as nominated by the association before the tournament. So um, all these procedures have to be done before. Uh, it was difficult. It was new for uh, a few years ago. But looking at the last tournaments, I would say that we didn't have any problem anymore, uh, especially on the top level, of course. Um, how is the, the feeling for the players and the coaches, John? Was it difficult for them, or is it disturbing for them that they have to go there before? 
No, I, I think I think now it's really part of their routine. I think it really helps them to, as you say, tidy the which shirt they have to wear, um, hand their rackets in, test the balls, and then they really have the peace of mind to to start the game well in advance. So I think from a from a team captain or a coach perspective, I think it's also a good mental mental area. It's it's, it's really really the start of the game. Where they can, where they can uh, focus now completely on the on the match at hand. So I think it's it was a change that I think was well well received by by everybody. Okay, good idea. And there's one discussion point. Sometimes really is about the color of the shirts. Here I would like all co all coaches to understand. Uh, that it is expected, especially on the top level, that you have two different color of shirts. And uh, if if there's a clash, then there has to be a toss. So we cannot say we only have one color of shirt. So there have to be two sets. That's that's important. This is in the moment. I would say the only problem we are having somehow. And also good for us. The call area is that the record is tested before, and there's no discussion anymore at the table. Okay. So just related to to this, if if the captain is not arriving on time, is also losing the right to choose the balls or not? If uh, here we have to be uh, careful because uh, for the balls normally you have a little bit more time. It's uh, normally the players are coming very often for, but if it's only the uh, the captain, if uh, if it's 45 minutes, there's no problem for the balls. Normally we give. Latest 20 minutes before you have to give the ball to us. So the, the, the ball is not the big problem because we say if it's a multi ball, for example, uh, 15 balls, team A, 15 balls, team B. So if 20 minutes before the start of the match, team B has not uh, chosen uh, the balls, then the, uh, the umpire will take 15 balls. So here it's not really 45 minutes. Here we have normally a little bit more time. Uh, the whole procedure about the bench side, about A, B, about the color of shirts is also important because we have TV very often and they have to know it quite in advance also. It's also important. But the balls, it's not always 45 minutes. But don't forget, if you are not there, the, the umpire will take the balls. What are the most common problems happening normally at the call area? The problems, uh, as I told you, is the color of the shirts normally is the biggest problem because the others are for the records, 98, 99% the records are always okay already. So there's no problem for this. And of course, if you come a little bit late, so color of shirts and if you are too late. And for the coaches, John? Yeah, generally the shirts is, a, is, a, is, is the biggest problem in this time 45 minutes before because you have some players who who have nearly already decided which shirt they will wear almost before they before their procedures and then yeah it's obviously if we lose the toss we have to change the shirt and it's it can be a little bit of a dis disturbance for the players but generally that's the biggest problem so we were discussing uh in our committee also and uh with um Competition department, would there, would it be uh, okay or interesting for the coaches that we say you can um, put your color online before the match? So it's like it opens a box and two hours before the match, you are going to uh, write the co name of the coach and also, for example, black as a color of shirt. And then we yeah, know this, it's not cash. Yeah, this would be a big improvement. But as I say, the shirt, the shirt part is probably the biggest problem we have. It's you know, uh, running around after the, the call area to tell the players this is the shirt you will wear and, and so on. And if you have this prepared in advance, like you say online, and yeah, I think it would take a lot of stress from from the coaches and the players in this in this room. Okay. Good. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So this is just a, a short summary of the most important topics. Perhaps. Uh, just to share for me was one really interesting example was uh, I had uh, 
big troubles during a match for, uh, with the German team because of the service. And uh, then there was an appeal and uh, it was done by, by Richard Brause who called me and said he's not satisfied with this one. And then we had a discussion and in reality, we both knew uh, that we cannot change the situation because for example, the service in this case was illegal, but uh, it took us two, three minutes, four minutes to discuss it. And uh, we both knew that these three minutes have been important for the player. That's what also Richard Blausen knew, uh, but we had to do this. So at the end, uh, we have to see, okay, my role as a referee was to go there to accept the appeal and uh, the coach was to support his player. So that's why we should never forget there are two objectives and uh, we have to do our role. We have to play our role, of course, also, but try to do it in a way that it's not uh, uh, a problem for the opponent, of course. Try to find a, a balance to accept both. Good. One thing just related to, to rackets because uh, we didn't talk too much about them and what are uh, the because now the racket is is requested for the test what are the feelings john from the players or the coaches when they need the racket for 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 pra practice time uh, before the match or even if it's in a team match to go to another uh, practice hall uh, room yeah i i think um as Werner said some of these rules are were, were quite new, um, but I think now the modern professional player is is ready to play with three or four or five rackets. I think it's it's more like tennis now in terms of not just the one racket. So when you've even handed your racket in for, for the match and, and you want to hit some balls before you play, you can just play with your second or third racket. And I think the majority of players are getting more and more comfortable from from having three, four or five rackets prepared for, for major events. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Werner, for this uh, presentation and all this uh, knowledge that could affect coaches and players in their job during competitions. Now it's time for the questions and answers from our participants to the panelists before uh, during the registration process we had already some uh, questions to be done so yes the first one is from Santanu Roy from India and for both of you what is the correct time to take time out from the legal point of view, also from, from the coach. Okay, so from my side, it should be between rallies. You can take a time out. So the legal point is, is easy. It's, I think it's more important now with John because he knows the best time for, for a time out. I always take the right time outs. Um, I think from the, my perspective, it's very much feeling with the, with the player. And um, we also have one, one rule when it's individual, we, we decide in an individual match, we decide between the player and the coach who, who should, who should initiate the timeout. I think this is one clear rule we try to have, especially at senior level. Um, but in the team matches, it's always myself as coach. I will take the decision for the team. In terms of the right moment, in terms of matches, I think it's, it's definitely that feeling or how you know your players. And, and I think it's, it's the decision you make in the matches probably from previous work in the training hall and in, in, in other competitions where you really understand your player. So I think it's definitely based on on, 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 a, on a feeling um, from my perspective. Perhaps also to add, this is, uh, because this is important, as you mentioned, uh, uh, who is allowed to take a timeout? So if it's an individual event and uh, if the player and John would be would not agree if it's a timeout or not a timeout in an individual event, it would be the player who decide if it's a timeout. So it's his final decision, it's not the coach. Whereas it, if it's a team event, then it's a decision of the captain. So it might happen happen if if the captain says I want to have a timeout and the player says no, then of course it, it, it's still a timeout because the final decision is done by the 
in a team event by the captain. Good. Thank you very much. We have a question that is coming from Alberto Herrera from Spain, also from Con Higgin from Ireland, and Asko Rasinen from Finland. It's about the rule of hiding service, the illegal service. So how coaches ensure players know how to serve correctly and also if a player is is doing it, what the other player could do. Perhaps first, uh, John. So how do you ensure that there are no illegal services in, in your team? This is a this is a difficult uh, difficult one. We have a lot of players within the team and with individual styles. Um, obviously, we we don't try to encourage uh, illegal serves, but I will say a lot of the players are borderline in in what is legal and what is illegal. And um, I think yeah, okay, there is some players who have completely the correct serve, but I think in in general it's very borderline with the majority of players. I think. In that fact, I think you have to be prepared that maybe somebody will will call your serve or will 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 affect you in a match. And and we try to work a little bit. What's what what's the alternative serve? Where do you go to when when the umpire will will take your first serve and say no, that's not correct. So we try to be proactive in terms of what is our next serve and and where do we go from there rather than have no more options. So I think. Is a very difficult, a difficult uh, area. Of course, from a young age, we try to teach the the perfect serve. But of course, a high level sport in in high level matches, yeah, it is very borderline. I would say, depending on individuals. I think also this is also something has to be we have to know as a as an official. This is human being. I would say you are testing the limits. How far how far can I go? So it's uh, up to the official to stop it. If it's going to be illegal, we have to stop it. I know it's difficult. It's a it's a topic now for more than I don't know centuries already, not not years anymore. How can we change the service rule? But in the moment, there's no change, so we have to apply to the service rule. And uh, if it's illegal, then it's a service fault, and we have to act and we have to call the service fault. We should not be the, be afraid. And then I agree with John. The player, okay, the player can complain. The, the coach might make a protest, but it's clear we have to. The, the player has to have at least for the next one a legal one. So we shouldn't only train with one service; we have two or three services. But it's our task to set the limits and to say so how far you can go. And there are rules, and we have to apply the rules. Yeah, and I, I think Werner, as you say, as coaches, you know, the players they're always going to take take what they can to the limit. And I think in service, it's also a little bit individual to the player. It's probably less coached from our side and more more built from individual players. So we are actually kind of out of the loop as coaches as well and how they serve. It's a little bit really an individual technical point. So yeah, I will just say exactly that. It's about being able to adapt it if your serve is called a fault. Okay. The next question is from Margi Haden from India. A player regularly delaying by bouncing the ball or doing things similar before serving. What can be done by the opposing player to stop this behavior? The opposing player, the opposing player can uh, again can if it's an individual event can make an appeal and can say this is time wasting. And then there might be a decision of the referee at the end. Uh, but normally, as an as a as an umpire, bouncing a, a few times on the table, uh, if it's really delaying the game, if it's disturbing the game, it's not allowed, of course. Yeah, from from a from a coach's side, of course, we try to give certain tricks to the to the players or certain advice to slow or speed the game in in a certain in a certain way, um, and again, it's similar to the illegal serve. I mean, if you take a step too far and and you're taking too long, then the, the question will be that you will be penalised. Um, but of course, our players do try to take a full advantage of, of of every moment. 
The next question is from phone Mayant from Myanmar. Is there any rules for coaching players at, at ITTF sanction tournament? Is the coach needing international coaching license? I just say from, from our side, uh, everyone who is authorized in the playing area, so in the venue, uh, can coach uh, the different, if there are different licenses, uh, John, is, can you give some information? Yeah, from, from, from my mind, we, we have had players with uh, coaches with varying licenses coaching at, at competitions. I don't, I don't think there's a specific license for, for coaching the, your national team at, at an international event or, or at certain events. Uh, maybe in, in things like the Bundesliga, to be a, be a Bundesliga coach, maybe you need to be an A license in Germany. This is one of the only areas that have, that have been seen a situation like that. But in terms of international, I think, yeah, any license, if you have an accreditation, you can coach. This, the next one is from, uh, for you, uh, Jon, I think. Gunnar Homestead from Sweden. Are there any areas of the rules where coaches have less knowledge or that coaches find harder to interpret than others? Um, I think we we try to have a have a a full knowledge of the rules. I think if we don't know what's happening, it's it's hard for the players to know. Um, I will say, yeah, I mean, around some of the why the players might be carded, yellow cards, and so on. Maybe we don't we're not fully aware, as I said earlier on, at some of the things, and maybe you know, kicking the ball away a little bit and every rule to to the T. Maybe we don't know know those completely uh, right out but generally i think most of the rules the coach will be well aware of especially coaching at high level internationally so the next question is from Iain ring does the team captain have to have the same color of shirt as the player no according to the rules no no problem Uh, now, Terry Canup from uh, USA, would you suggest going over the rules with coaches at a pre-event meeting? Or perhaps how to make coaches knowing the rules? Uh, what we do in Austria, uh, if, you, if you are uh, going to be a coach, we have different levels, of course, and uh, I'm the one who is uh, training or who is who is taking part in such co such courses, and I give between four to eight hours, depending, of course, on the level, on rules and regulations and procedures. So that's how we try uh, to ensure in Austria that the coaches uh, have knowledge about the rules. So they have to do this, and there's also a test, an exam on this part of the whole exam is about the rules and regulations. In Austria, on the on the top level, uh, I don't think uh, we need uh, really a meeting with the coaches uh, because they are it's like in a circus. They are nearly each week in a different tournament, so they know they know the rules. Most of us know each other already. But for the lower level, uh, we include it in our own training. I don't know how it's in in, in Australia. Yeah, I think I think I agree. I think it's for the education of coaches. I think it's very important. So I agree that that for coaches who want to improve their coach license and so on, that it's very important to to educate it in 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 that level. Where I think at the higher level or at international level, they're just the same rules every week. It's just a different city, as you said. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, uh, Werner. We, we were coming to, to the time, so now we go to the wrap up of the final wrapping up. So rule interpretation could be useful, not only for match officials, but we see here also for players and coaches. 
in the call area, the things to be done and the times in which those things are done are very important for the players and for the coaches. The communication between coaches and pies, referees and players is important as many times in the way that is taking will make it easier to resolve the problems. So we tried with this webinar to let know coaches and players better the rules and also the umpires to be able to see the fairs of players and coaches. From the whole high performance and development team, thanks to all two panelists, Bernard and John, for taking the time to share with us. And also thank you very much to all our friends in each corner of the world for your attention and contribution today. A reminder that this Friday we will release the first episode of the third season of the weekly training lessons, the time with SWAT, special weapons and tactics dedicated to tactics. You can follow it in the ITTF YouTube channel. And we hope to see you in the next webinar, Tuesday the 9th. Yes, it will be on Tuesday. 2 p.m. Central European time with the topic coaching pathway. So have a nice day or a nice rest. Thank you very much to all.